Well, good morning, church. So glad we get to gather together in this warm, dry building this morning. Man, it is wet and windy out there today. Well, you can turn to Luke chapter 3. We're going to be continuing our study through the book of Luke. And as we're going through Luke, we're, we're calling this series Good News for Everyone. As we continue on past the Advent series we've gone through, the beginning of Luke, and now we're turning this corner to see that really Luke's desire as he writes this gospel is to make clear that the gospel is good news for everyone. More than any of the other gospels, Luke makes it a priority to continually point to this fact. We'll see it in our text today. We see it all throughout this gospel that this is not a gospel for just one small group of people in one region or in one religion or for one race, that this is good news for all people that would come to Jesus. And this morning we're picking up that story in Luke chapter 3 where we're given uh, a bit of the background and and some of the message of John the Baptist and what he came to do, what he came to proclaim as he was the forerunner of the Messiah, the one who would prepare the way. Beginning in Luke chapter 3 verse 1, here's what we read. It says, Now in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, Pontius Pilate being governor of Judea, Herod being Tetrarch of Galilee, his brother Philip, Tetrarch of Iturea, and the region of Triconitus and Licinius, Tetrarch of Abilene, while Annas and Caiaphas were high priests, the word of God came to John, the son of Zacharias, in the wilderness. And he went into all the region around the Jordan, preaching a baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. As it is written in the book of the words of Isaiah the prophet, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. Every valley shall be filled and every mountain and hill brought low. The crooked places shall be made straight and the rough ways smooth, and all flesh shall see the salvation of God." Then he said to the multitudes that came out to be baptized by him, Brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Therefore bear fruits worthy of repentance, and do not begin to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. For I say to you that God is able to raise up children to Abraham from these stones. And even now the axe is laid to the root of the trees." Therefore, every tree which, was, which does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. So the people asked him, saying, What shall we do then? And he answered and said to them, He who has two tunics, let him give to him who has none. And he who has food, let him do likewise. Then the tax collectors also came to be baptized and said to him, Teacher, what shall we do? And he said to them, collect no more than what is appointed for you. Likewise, the soldiers asked him, saying, and what shall we do? And he said to them, do not intimidate anyone or accuse falsely and be content with your wages. Now, as the people were in expectation and all reasoned in their hearts about John, whether he was the Christ or not, John answered, saying to all, I indeed baptize you with water, but one mightier than I is coming, whose sandal strap I am not worthy to loose. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly clean out his threshing floor and gather the wheat into his barn, but the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire." And with many other exhortations, he preached to the people. But Herod, the Tetrarch, being rebuked by him concerning Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, and for all the evils which Herod had done, also added this above all, that he shut John up in prison. Let's pray this morning. 
Lord, as we come before your word and see a man, John, called by you before birth to prepare the way for the Messiah, we pray, God, that you would instruct us this morning through your living word, that you would correct us where we need it, that we would be a people this morning with ears ready to hear. God, we need more than words this morning. We need the living, active, powerful words of God. Lord, we need more than a teaching. We need your word to pierce our hearts, to speak into our lives, to correct us where we have gone astray, to lead us as we move forward. Lord, this morning, would your word be a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. We thank you for your word, for this time we can come together and learn from it. Let it be to your glory, your honor, and your praise. And it's in your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, if you're taking notes this morning and you want to write down a title for this section we're looking at, you can write this, Paving the Way. Paving the Way. That's what we see John doing as he prepares the way for Jesus to come on to the scene in ministry. But I liked using that phrase, paving the way, because uh, in my hometown where I grew up, I had the opportunity to work for the city for a while on their street crew. And I got to be a part of helping pave some roads. And if you've ever seen guys that are working on repaving a road, man, it is is labor-intensive work. It is hot out there. I mean, the, the pavement you're working with is hot, it's, it's dangerous to touch your skin. It, it molds fairly quickly, though, and once that stuff hardens, you're not going to move it or break it easily. And so it's a quick, fast-paced job that often involves long hours, and you're not done till you're done because you can't just leave that stuff to cool. But as I was thinking about the ministry God called John to, I was reflecting on how, how it compared to paving when I had to be a part of those crews and And the first thing you did in preparing the way was that you had to break up the old rocky ground where there's potholes and cracks and things are just falling apart. You first have to break that up. There's an easier job we could have done, which is just an overlay where you just put a nice smooth surface over the top, but that's not going to last. Slowly, what's underneath is going to start coming through and there'll be new cracks and new problems to deal with. If you wanted a true, lasting result, you had to dig deep. You had to break up that old stuff. You had to dig out the roots that were causing those cracks and get a better, firm foundation underneath, get a good base so that you could lay new foundation. And then you'd make it straight. They'd put good barriers on the side. They'd want to make sure this road was something smooth, something easy to drive on. But it wasn't about making the distance shorter for those who traveled on it, as if we could even do so. The ultimate goal as you're repaving this road was about making it as smooth and accessible as possible for people to travel on. Knowing that people would travel on these roads all the time, hundreds if not thousands of cars constantly driving over them, knowing that this was a main path people were going to go on, We wanted to remove any barriers we could, any bumps, cracks, slopes, obstacles. You wanted to get those out of the way to prevent danger, to prevent any kind of accidents that could come, to make it as smooth as possible. And what we see John doing here is preparing the way for Jesus to come in and his ministry to go forth, that John is coming to break up some hard hearts And he's trying to remove some of the obstacles and the sins that are in people's lives so that he could prepare them for Jesus, the way that would come. His goal wasn't to try and create some kind of shortcut to salvation, not that he even could, but rather to to smooth out the path for those who would come after him and to remove obstacles that may have been keeping them from getting to Jesus. As we begin, Luke, the doctor, the historian that he was, 
he gives us a list of all these leaders. In fact, one commentator says that Luke's precision in naming five Roman officials with their specific titles, it shows concern for detailed historical accuracy. And his accuracy is actually confirmed by historical records outside of the Bible. Luke was a man of detail. And so he's giving us a context. Some of the other gospels just say, and then at this time or at such a time, but Luke wants to give you all the details. He tells you who are the political leaders in the area surrounding where they're at. Who are the religious leaders in the surrounding area? And it doesn't just give us a timeline. It gives you a culture that you understand what kind of life these people were living that were under these leaders. Because although we don't know a lot about these leaders, one thing we know about all of them is that they weren't very good dudes. There were some pretty wicked leaders in this bunch. They were selfish men. They were constantly at odds with other men. They weren't thinking about what was best for the people. That's for certain. And this is the context that John comes on the scene, this man in the wilderness to prepare the way for Jesus. There was a lot of rocky ground he was having to break through. He's not living in a time where there is these great godly men that are in authority with godly rules that are going forth and a people that are living in obedience to God. He's coming in a time under wicked leadership where everybody, you could say, is doing what's right in their own eyes and he's trying to prepare the way for the Messiah. And some of these political leaders, they're given this title that they were the Tetrarch of a region. And that word tetrarch originally, it meant a fourth. It was a leader of a fourth. So when a king would divide his area between four men, each would be a tetrarch. And it gets a little confusing because you'll see that Herod the Great had three sons that he's given his region to. And so you're doing the math and you're saying, how do three sons all rule over a fourth? Well, that phrase originally, though it meant a fourth, it slowly became just a title for a governing authority over a region. And so these three sons, they're given authority over a different region that they're ruling in. And then we're told about two high priests, which is also something unique. You've got Annas and Caiaphas. But there would only ever be one high priest at a time. And when this is written by Luke, Annas has actually retired from the position and handed it to Caiaphas However, the people still very much viewed Annas as the high priest, which is why we still see both recognized here, as Luke in detail mentions this, as religious leaders. But here's what's interesting. Five political leaders, two religious leaders, all mentioned, and yet we don't see the word of God in our text coming to any of them. The word of God didn't come to this political leader here or this high priest or the previous high priest that people still view in authority. It came to a nomadic man in the desert, a place where even the weeds can't grow, where the temperature gets up to 120 plus degrees, a man who wore animal skins and ate locusts, and it begs the question, why? Why? If you were going to send a message that you wanted to get out to all the people and prepare them for the coming Messiah, wouldn't you go to those that are in a political place of authority? Or wouldn't you go to the religious people that are in authority that the people look to? Surely if you want a message to get out and you want people ready when the Messiah comes, you're not going to the nomadic man in the desert. Why is this the person that God chose to send his word through. Because according to God's standards, John was described as great before he was ever born. As the angel spoke to his father that day in the temple, and God had plans to use this man in the desert as his messenger. God didn't need the influence of the Roman officials He could turn the hearts of any ruler wherever he wanted. He wasn't in need of their power and authority. This is the God who gave them that place of authority and could take it away in a moment. This is the omnipotent God who's created everything and spoke it into existence. 
He's not limited in his power or his authority. He certainly didn't need their positions to accomplish his will. As we see here, he can use whomever he sees fit to perform his will. I'm sure many of you have heard that that phrase that God doesn't call the equipped, but he equips the called. That God didn't look around and say, all right, I need a guy that has this and this and this because I have to accomplish this. God said, I'm going to choose whom I will, and I'm going to equip him for the task I'm giving to him. Before John was ever born, God said, this is going to be my man. He is going to be my messenger, and he's the one I will equip for that task. This is the way God works, often through unlikely suspects who are in the midst of the most unlikely of places. I wonder today if there are some here who deeply desire to be used by God, but you're believing a lie this morning. A lie that says if only you had a better position at work or in the community, then you could start being used in a great way by God. A lie that says if only you had a better reputation or an upbringing, then you could speak in an effective way for God. A lie that says if only I had a better opportunity before me or a greater platform to speak out, then I could make a difference for the Lord in a substantial way. Realize this morning, John didn't have any of those things. But God had called him and used him anyway. David didn't have any of those things. And yet God called him to be a king, a mighty warrior, a man after his own heart. The least of his brothers, a shepherd boy. Mary didn't have any of those things, and yet God called her to be the vessel through whom he would bring his Messiah into the world, a lowly maidservant who Elizabeth said, no, now you're blessed among all women. Believer, how are you being faithful with where you are and who God has called you to be? Be faithful over little He will bring the increase. Don't allow yourself to believe the lie that once I get there, then I can be used by God. Once I have this, then I can be effective for the kingdom of God. He desires to use you today, now, with what he's given you. And even the little you may feel you have to offer is enough when it's placed in the hands of God. Or do we need to go back and remember a time where they only had a little bit of fish and a few loaves to feed thousands, and yet when they placed it in the hands of God, he broke it and he blessed it, and it was more than enough. John was God's man, called on the scene to go out from that place in the wilderness and preach the gospel to these people. And what was his message he came to bring? a baptism of repentance. John was sharing a message that called people to turn from their sin. He was offering people an opportunity to turn from their own ways and to follow Christ, the coming Messiah that was coming after him. And that's what it means to repent. It's changing your direction. It's changing your thinking and your actions It doesn't just mean you feel sorry for yourself or you regret what you've done. It means that you're changing the way you look at that thing and in turn, you're moving your direction another way. You're correcting your course in light of what has been done. This is the message John came to bring, to make crooked paths straight again, to hold people to a godly standard that wasn't allowing compromise. And that took breaking up some hard ground because we can be a stiff-necked people who have hard hearts. We live in a very similar time to John where we can see wicked rulers and leaders over us 
or we look around at a culture of sin and compromise and wickedness, and where we too in turn are called to go out and prepare the way because our Messiah is returning. And the message we declare, like John's, is not one that makes you feel all warm and fuzzy inside. It's one of repentance that calls people to change their ways. It's not a gospel of health and wealth and ease and everything you've ever wanted. It's a gospel that calls you to lay down your life, to love your enemies, to to pray for those who persecute you and serve those around you. It's It's a gospel that calls you each and every day of your life to get up and deny yourself, to take up your cross and follow Jesus. It's a message that calls you to act not just to sit and smile and clap. See, the gospel calls us to a response. The first two letters of the gospel call you to go, not just to sit and to stay. And we see that this message calls people to action because the response of everyone we will look at is the same. They go to John and they say, what should we do? Not just what should we think, what should we say, what, what should we do? How should we act? The gospel is calling them to a changed life that comes from a changed heart, from a changed mind that has responded in repentance. Now, he came to bring a baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. And I don't want any confusion this morning. John is not saying that baptism equals salvation. We are not a church that believes that baptism equals salvation. But he is calling and preparing them for the Messiah that would come. And that first step is one of repentance And then faith in the Messiah. And only faith in Jesus brings the forgiveness of sins. Now what's unique and interesting about what John is doing here is that understand their culture. The only time people were getting baptized in this culture was one, if you were a Jew, or excuse me, a Gentile that was proselytizing, that was becoming a Jew... They would baptize you. A Jewish person would take you in and baptize you and you're ceremonially cleansed and no longer a Jew or Gentile, you're now a Jew. The other time is when someone was ritually unclean in their culture, they would go and they would be cleansed and baptized so they could go and offer their sacrifice in the temple and be cleansed once again. But what we see John calling people to here, the baptism he's inviting them into, is not for Gentiles to become Jews, and it's not this ceremonially cleansed process so they could go in and offer a sacrifice. He's calling them all, Jew and Gentile alike, to repentance and faith in Christ, to a different kind of baptism. Not one that made you clean for a day, but one that could remove your sin altogether. The remission of sins. And he says he has come to prepare the way of the Lord and make his his paths straight. He's fulfilling the words of Isaiah, the prophet we see here, as the voice of one crying in the wilderness. But this idea of preparing the way of the Lord, making his paths straight and every valley filled, every mountain hill brought low. There was a practice at this time that John is speaking to, that this prophecy of Isaiah is comparing what he's doing to. And it was this practice that when a king was traveling to the region that was under his dominion, he would first send out a courier. And that courier would go and announce, the king is going to be coming to this city. The king is going to be coming to this region. And then would instruct the people to prepare the way, to fix the roads, to remove the obstacles, get the rocks out of the road, clean it up and make the path straight because the king is passing through here. 
And in turn, the people would respond. They would go out and they would tidy up the streets and they would clean up the way for the coming king and the great honor it was for him to pass through their area. Now, although we don't practice this in our culture today, this is still practiced in many cultures today. In fact, when I went to visit my good friend UJ in Kenya, I was going to visit him at the end of a long trip that he had been there on. And he was telling me that a few weeks prior to my arrival that there was a famous prophet that was coming into this area. And in preparation, in the same way that they did in these times that we're reading about, a courier was sent out that was preparing the way that this prophet would travel all the way from the airport where he would land to the place that he was staying, to the places that he would go, and they were sweeping the roads that he would be driving on, the paths that he would be walking on. Everywhere this man went, they wanted it to be clean, for it to be tidy, for it to be removed of any obstacles, for nothing to be in his way. They wanted to honor him. They wanted to be prepared for his arrival. John here is saying, I'm the one that is coming to tell you guys as the courier, the messenger, that the king is coming. And you need to prepare the way of your hearts for his arrival. You need to remove the sin that's in your life, these obstacles that create a distance between you and him. You need to get that out of the way because the Messiah is coming. Let me ask you this morning, is your life smoothing and straightening the path for other people to come to Jesus? It starts with your own heart, but then how are you going out as a messenger like John to prepare the way for Jesus to come into the hearts of others? Is it your goal in life to remove barriers and to make bridges to ready other people for his return? Because it should be. And what is the goal in this preparing the way it says in the end of verse 6? And all flesh shall see the salvation of God. Once again, Luke really wants this detail in there because the gospel is for all flesh. It's for all people. It calls all people to the same repentance so that all people can experience the same salvation that Jesus offers. And I love the way that, that John in this moment, as if it wasn't already enough that he's calling people to repentance, which is a hard message to preach and a hard message for people to receive, look at the way he addresses the people here. He says to the multitudes that come out to be baptized by him, Oh, you beautiful people. No, that's not what he says. He says, you brood of vipers. You group of poisonous, slimy snakes. Who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? John sees the pride. He sees the hypocrisy within these people, and he calls it out. He's not trying to coerce these people with some kind of smooth speech. He just calls it as he sees it. You brood of vipers. You know, it reminds me of someone, Jesus, and the way that he would speak to the Pharisees in his day. He says, you need to bear fruits worthy of repentance. You need to live a life that backs up what you're saying. And he says, and do not begin to say to yourselves, well, we have Abraham as our father. It's all good. We're we're kind of inherited into this. See, he gets to the core of it, this arrogance that they had, this pride that they were walking with. It was in their relation to Abraham, the father of faith. And so they had this false belief that simply because they were Jewish, that they came from the line of Abraham, that they had a right standing with God. doesn't work like that. 
You don't get to be born into a Christian family and come out a saved sinner. Now, salvation is hereditary, but it only runs through the blood of one man, and that man is Jesus. And the only family that the salvation gene is found in is the family of faith that comes to him as their heavenly father and accepts his sacrifice on their behalf. Hear me on this. Your parents' salvation won't save you. Your church attendance won't save you. Your scripture memorization won't save you. You must confess your sins. Repent of your sins and turn to the only one who can pay for them. And John, we see in this moment, using such strong language because he's furious at this moment that he sees a lost people who think they're found. A dead people that think they're alive. A people in desperate need of a Savior that were going to miss him because of their arrogance. A people that were proclaiming a way that wasn't the way. The blind leading the blind, whitewashed tombs, the religious leaders that were meant to point people to the Messiah that were creating crooked paths that were causing confusion. And John says, you're a brood of vipers. You're poisonous snakes. You're not speaking the truth. You're not calling people to repentance. You're putting them under a bondage that they cannot carry. A weight that's too heavy to bear. You need to be pointing them to one that is greater, who can bear that for them. But instead, you're putting the weight of their salvation on themselves. And he says, There's a tell. And it's the fruit of repentance. He says, if you're truly a people who have repented, then there should be fruit of it in your life. If you've truly turned from your old wicked ways, then it should show in the way you live now. And what does he have to say of those who aren't bearing fruit? They will be chopped down and thrown into an unquenchable fire. Because a fruit tree that doesn't bear fruit has no use. A person unwilling to repent and turn from their sins is not fit for the work of the kingdom of God. Jesus says this in Matthew 7 when he says a good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. And John is saying, you're proclaiming that you're a good tree bearing good fruit, but I don't see good fruit coming from this. I see no fruit, or I see bad fruit. But if you were truly a good tree bearing good fruit, there should be fruits of it in your life. There should be evidence in your life. I should see a changed person with a changed heart and a changed direction. And John, with this heavy-hitting message, not looking to appease anyone and make everybody just walk away with smiles, wanting to see true transformation take place, has cut to the heart of these people. And we know this because their response is not, forget this crazy guy out in the desert. We don't need to hear this message. Let's go. The people come to him. They're drawn in. They're not pushed away. And they say, what shall we do? It reminds me of the beginning of Acts when Peter is, is filled with the Spirit and he goes out and proclaims this bold message that, that tells the people that Jesus' blood is on your hands. And the people, it says, are cut to the heart and they ask him, what shall we do? That's the right response of a person who feels the weight and conviction of their sin and, and in repentance desires to change their direction and the desire is, what should I do? Where do we go from here? And he begins to speak to these different groups and calls them ultimately to the same thing, but 
he emphasizes different aspects of what this fruit of repentance should look like. And as this first general group comes to him and says, what should we do? He calls them to a fruit of repentance that looks like service and generosity. The first thing John tells them that is displayed in the life of someone who's truly repented and turned from their sins is that there's a willingness to serve those who have less than them. That as we come to Jesus in desperate need of help and salvation and are hopeless without him and he in his love and kindness in his grace towards us forgives us, welcomes us into his family, empowers us by his Holy Spirit and then sends us out, our response is to go and look to serve others. Say, how can I help others? Because I have been helped abundantly above what I could ask. And so he says, give your tunic to him who has none. And those who are in need of food, do the same. Do likewise, give to those who need. Your greatest need has been met in Jesus. How can you go and meet the needs of others around you? It's to respond and do likewise. It's to follow in the the footsteps of Jesus. And then come along the tax collectors a group of despised individuals because of their reputation for taking the money from people and then taking a little extra and keeping that little extra for themselves. The tax collectors are cut to the heart by John's message. They go to John and they say, what shall we do? And he says, the fruit of repentance in your life is going to look like honesty and integrity. A people notorious for dishonesty says, if you've truly repented from your sins, if you truly want to turn from your own wicked ways to Christ, it should show in the way you work. Your work ethic should display that you are a person who belongs to Christ. That they should be a people that know even if no other person sees it, God sees it. And even if everyone else is doing it and culturally it's kind of just accepted, I'm called to a higher standard. I'm doing my work unto the Lord. And because they've experienced the grace and mercy of God, it should draw them to integrity and honesty in their work with others. Maybe you can get away with it in your life. Maybe it's a morally gray area that you feel like you can justify and you'll get plenty of sleep, no problem. But as a follower of Christ, that's been called to be an example of Him to the world. Salt and light to the earth. What does a fruit of repentance look like in your life? How has there been dishonesty, disloyalty that needs to be replaced with integrity? Paul speaks to this in Ephesians 4, 28, when he says, Let him who stole steal no longer, but rather let him labor, working with his hands what is good, listen to this, that he may have something to give him who has need. So it's not just working so that I can store up bigger barns to keep more stuff. But ultimately, it's it's working in honesty and integrity so that I can truly work and earn the things I'm given so that I can give to those who have need. It's still having open hands with everything God puts in them to say, how can I give it back, Lord, to the kingdom of God? Lord, I'm a vessel, so what you pour in, I want to be poured out. And then the soldiers approach John. These strong men with their shields and their swords. These tough men that you wouldn't want to cross. And they approach John and ask, what is it that we should do? Soldiers known for intimidating people or falsely accusing them to get what they want. And here John calls them to lay that kind of lifestyle down. 
and with true repentance, live in a better way that is marked by gentleness and contentment. No longer men marked by a harshness that can cut anyone down, that gets in their way, that can enforce their will upon anyone by strength and numbers and power. Some of you can do this with your words. You're a quick thinker, you're quick with your words, and you, you speak with such passion and conviction, and yet you're cutting others down, you're, you're breaking them up, you're discouraging people and enforcing your will. And yet, we're called to be slow to speak and slow to wrath, quick to listen. We're called to be as wise as serpents, but as gentle as doves. And John says, you guys that are just enforcing your will and pushing people around because they can't come back against you, you've got the weapon, you've got the whole political side on your back, supporting you, protecting you. John says, if you're truly repentant, it should show forth in the way you guys treat people, no longer enforcing your power on them, but, but demonstrating a gentleness and a kindness using your strength to protect the weak, to look out for the vulnerable, not to take advantage of them. Using your strength to uplift them and build them up and not to belittle them and condemn them because they're not at the place of strength you find yourself at. Because every follower of believer, no matter how strong we may be in one area, when we truly walk in a way of repentance and humility, we understand that just because I'm strong in this area doesn't mean I have it all together. And I know for a fact that just because I'm strong in this area, there's an area I'm weak in that you're strong in. And I don't want you to, to belittle me and push me down in that area I'm weak in. I want you to build me up. And when everybody uses their strength, not as a platform to boast in, but as an opportunity to build up others in their weakness, now we can support each other like the body is meant to function. Now I can use my strength to help you in your weakness because I hope in turn, when we're at a place that is exposing my weakness, I'm looked upon with kindness as well as you build me up and we're better together. Not in greediness that always looks for its own benefit, and how to get ahead, but in a godly contentment that is satisfied with our honest earnings from our work and with what the Lord has given us to steward. See, this is so countercultural to their time, but to our time today as well, that says, man, if someone's in your way, just step on their back and go right over them. You need to get yours. You need to get ahead. Everything's a competition, but not in the kingdom of God. We succeed together as a team, as a body, as a family. There's no lone rangers that go off on their own and say, ah, oh, these people are too slow, they're not as far along. Oh, they're still struggling with that, forget it, I'm out of here. Think about Christ who came and spent his life with these 12 disciples. Fishermen, tax collectors, guys who spoke out of turn, guys who were always arguing about who's the greatest, one who would betray him. He's stronger than all of them. He's more capable than all of them, but we don't see him just constantly belittling them. He's empowering them. He's loving them. He's teaching them. He's coming alongside them and discipling them. And this is how the church is meant to thrive. And this is what he calls the people to. And the people are amazed at the wisdom of John, at the power of his words. And so, it says all these people were in expectation and, and they're all reasoning in their hearts, is this the Christ? Is this the one? Is this the Messiah? Look at the power in, in what he's saying. Look at the response of the people. Is this the Christ? And there's a temptation, no doubt, that John is facing in this moment to take the credit and the glory for himself. He's gained a following. People are responding. They're looking to him and saying, you're incredible. Your words are powerful. Are you the one? But what makes John great is that he was able to get out of the way. 
He says, I'm baptizing you in water. There's one coming after me who baptizes with fire and with the Holy Spirit. And this one who is mightier than I, I'm not even worthy to loosen the strap of his sandal, which is a little funny in our culture (laughs) as we read that. But understand in a culture where it was dishonorable just to show someone the bottom of your foot, the sole of your shoe, that the lowest servant in the house would be the one who would wash the feet and no one else. John is saying, guys, don't even think for a moment that I'm the Christ. Let me tell you, the Christ is so much greater than I am. I'm just baptizing you with water and calling you repentance. He's going to baptize you with fire and with the Holy Spirit. I'm calling you to change your ways, but His Holy Spirit is going to empower you and refine you and sanctify you. There may be, may be some crowds here gathering as I speak, but he says, and he's coming to bring a whole new covenant to transform lives, to bring the church age into coming. And I'm not even worthy to touch his sandal. You might say, I'm not even worthy to clean the toilet of that man. No, John didn't want any of the glory in this moment. He came with a message that was to proclaim another. He came to prepare the way to the Messiah. But in each and every one of our lives, there's a temptation that the enemy brings to try and make yourself the means to the end. That when people look at your life and say, wow, you've got it all together. Oh, look at the way you've turned your life around. Look how smart you are. Look how strong you are. Look at all you're accomplishing. You're such a good person. How do you do it? There's this temptation in that moment to smile. (laughs) Well, thank you. (laughs) I am pretty good at it, aren't I? I do kind of have it all together. And yeah, I'd be happy for... Five easy payments of forty nine ninety five to tell you my secret to a better life. And what does John do in this moment? Guys, if you think I'm great, you think I'm the Messiah, let me tell you, there's one so much greater than I am. And people come to us and say, how do you do it? Dude, it's the Lord. Anything good that comes from us, that's the grace of God in our lives. We're not here to say, come to us. What did Paul say? Imitate me only as I imitate Christ. He's the author and finisher of your faith. You place your hope in a man and you will be disappointed. You place your hope in God and you will be sustained and strengthened. And he does not disappoint. John deflects and points to the Messiah, the one he came to prepare the way for. And we finish not on a happy note where everybody is turning to the Messiah and and ready for him to come onto the scene, but we end with this note that John, the truth teller, doesn't allow intimidation by religious leaders and those in authority over him to stop him from telling the truth. That's a great test of integrity. Sure, you'll tell the truth and you'll stand for the truth when you're in the body of Christ, when you're around people that are willing to hear it. What about when you're sharing the truth with people who want nothing to do with it and when there will actually be consequences for it? We see that John in his preparing the way and calling to people to repentance, openly rebukes the king for his adultery, for taking his brother's wife as his own while he already has a wife. And Herodias, this wife that he has taken on, she's furious. She wants John put to death for this. You know, it's not too far off from the same response you'll get in our culture today when you speak the truth. Call sin out in the world and watch as the world tries to cancel you, quiet you, or kill you. 
Mark 6 tells us that although Herodias wanted John to be put to death for this, for calling out their sin, that that Herod was unable to do it. Partially because of the influence that John had, but because of the life John lived, he said he's blameless, he's just. What do I possibly have against him? And also we read that he, he's intrigued by the message of this man. He also enjoys listening to these words, even if they're calling him out. There's a power behind them. But we know well as the story goes on, what would take place, that, that the daughter of Herod's new wife will dance before this ruler one day. And under the persuasion of her mother, will request the head of John the Baptist. A gift that Herod is caught in his promise and will will regrettably give her. And when you zoom out, if you were to see the life of John put on a resume for you, and his life of ministry, you'd see a man from the desert with only three years of ministry in his life, only one year outside of prison, the next two spent in prison before he's beheaded. His entire ministry, only three years. And we can quickly look at his life and feel sorry for him. See it as a waste of potential. But let's never forget how Jesus described John. In Matthew 11, when he said, Assuredly, I say to you, among those born of women, there has not risen one greater than John the Baptist. But he who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. See, through the eyes of Jesus, we see that John was truly great. Not only because of what the angel had said before his birth, that this would be a man who is great, but even Jesus backing it as his cousin would prepare the way for him to come onto the scene and call people to repentance. A life poured out for the glory of God is never wasted. No matter how long the days no matter how flashy the results, your life poured out for the glory of God is never wasted. No matter where you find yourself, no matter the consequences, it's a life of obedience and faithfulness. It's not going to be determined by the number of your days, but the substance of them. Better is three years like John of faithful ministry and obedience pointing people to Jesus than a decade of lukewarm Christianity that's spent on the bench. As we close this morning and I call the worship team to come back up, we're going to spend a time of worship and also a time of prayer. And I want to once again ask you the question this morning, is your life paving the way for Jesus? Is it marked by living a life that is set apart for him and his purposes? Is it a life speaking the word as he leads you? Is it calling hearts to repentance? Is it straightening a path that is crooked Smoothing a path that is rough. But realize this morning, before we can walk out those doors and go into this city and into this state and begin to try and prepare the way for others and make the path straight for others to come to Jesus, it starts with us. Before you can remove the speck in your brother's eye, you need to remove the log in your own. There's a quote that a wise man once told me. He said, you can't give what you don't have. You can't lead where you don't go. And you always reproduce what you are. We can't call people to repentance we ourselves haven't first walked in. We can't offer people the hope of salvation and the forgiveness of sins, the joy of the Lord that is our strength, if we have not first experienced that. 
and you will always reproduce what you are. A bad tree is going to produce bad fruit, and a good tree is going to produce good fruit. And if you want to bear much fruit, you need to abide in the vine that is Jesus, because apart from him, you can do nothing. So this morning, church, more than a farewell song that we sing as you are dismissed to leave, this is an invitation and a time to respond to what God is speaking to you this morning. Before we can go out there and say, Lord, use me in my home and my workplace in this city and the community around me to call people to repentance and make paths straight, Lord, I need you to first make my own crooked heart straight. Lord, I need you first to remove the plank in my own eye. Lord, don't allow us in our pride thinking that we've got it all together to go out there and just make a mess. And so in this moment, I want to give you an opportunity to respond. There are going to be people available in the front of the room, in the back of the room to pray with you, whatever it is. Don't waste that opportunity. Allow the Lord to prepare your heart and make it straight in this time so that you can go out there and be a vessel used for his glory. And maybe for some of you, you've never given your life to Jesus at all. And that conversation looks very different. It's the call that John made. It's a call to repentance, to turn from your sins, to stop living for your own way, your own will, your own kingdom, to give your life to Jesus, the one who paid for your sins, the one who offers you a better way, the one who can take that heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh, who can empower you with his Holy Spirit and equip you to go out there and do the work of ministry. But church, my, my greatest desire this morning, especially as we're entering a new year, is that we wouldn't be a people that play church. That we wouldn't be a people that are just content with attending on Sunday and checking the box. We'd be a people that truly desire each and every day of our lives to live this out. My hope and my prayer for you this morning is that as we spend this time in worship and, and others coming up for prayer is that you're allowing the Holy Spirit to reveal in your heart what needs to be revealed as you ask the same question these people asked in our text, God, what should I do? Lord, is that today for the first time giving my life over to you? Lord, is that today correcting some paths that are crooked? Lord, is that today seeking forgiveness somewhere? Lord, what would you have me to do today? And in the power of his spirit, by the grace of God, go and be obedient to that day. Let's pray. God, we are a people who stand before you today, only able to do so because of Jesus. Lord, we are a people whose hearts were hard, a people whose paths were crooked, people who were dead in our sin and under the power of darkness. And if it had not been for you, the God who is rich in mercy, slow to wrath, the God who came to dwell among us, the God whose kindness led us to repentance, the God who has conveyed us into the kingdom of the Son of his love. whom there is redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. God, had it not been for you, we would not be here. Lord, humble us this morning in areas of our life where we have allowed our strength to become a, a platform of pride. 
God, forgive us for the areas we have tried to call others into that we have not first ourselves walked into. God, forgive us for the areas that we have grown so calloused and so cold. And Lord, we pray this morning that your Holy Spirit would do a work in our hearts. Break the fallow ground. Remove those stones. Smooth the rough paths. Convict us of our sin. Call us out of a place of complacency. Lord, ignite that fire that once burned bright for you. We want to be a church that is alive. We want to be a church empowered by your spirit. God, we want to be a people who love because you first loved us. And Lord, we know that starts here and now. In this moment, being willing to respond to whatever you're calling us to not looking to the left or to the right, not waiting for someone else to respond, but a people who hear your voice, a sheep who know your voice and who go where you call us to go. Holy Spirit, show us this morning what we should do and then empower us to do so for your glory. It's in the mighty name of Jesus, the name that is above every name the name that every knee will bow to and every tongue will confess Jesus as Lord that we pray. And all God's people said, Amen.